able to see the stream here as well and see the questions. I don't know yet. Oh, I don't need to do that. That was a horrible mistake. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure where I see our current live stream. They see me. <laughs> so we're still trying to find you. So do you all have your drinks? Do you all have your food? Are you ready for Astronomy Cast 500? We, we are just trying to figure oh, out is. where the chat went. Yeah, I found it. When you start the stream, it disappears it. And then... There we go. There we go. I'll leave the chat there. I'll leave <laughs> your... <laughs> All right. Uh, and then... You've got this list here that you liked. Yeah. All right. So uh, before we get started on our 500th episode, um, we, we had fully intended to be like launching a big brand new website this week. And for those of you who are out on the stream, you're seeing that we have a brand new OBS theme that's going to match our website when we get it. But uh, the, the reason there's other things that didn't happen is I decided to fall off my bike and break my arm and I don't know how to code voice to text. <laughs> this is not to say I didn't try. That would be funny. <laughs> Just imagine. No. Backspace, backspace, left bracket, I curly tried. brace. No, that would be... It doesn't uh, work. Yeah. Um, so, so there will be a new website coming to celebrate our 500. And um, we're so glad that all of you are here to celebrate our 500th episode. And Astronomy Cast is now a teenager. We're entering our 13th season. Now, we wouldn't be here without you. This is entirely a fan supported show it well and advertisers i have a casper mattress he has a casper mattress hopefully many of you have casper mattresses i have david joseph wesley on my computer and on my phone and probably on another device in here as well um where's phoenix do you have a david joseph we have david on three <laughs> devices currently <laughs> hello david can uh, can <laughs> Is there a way that we can make him visible on the Yeah, YouTube he can come live? up here and be a, a face in a box, but we need his audio. Can, you can we turn up his audio and then... Hold on. Wait, give him the wireless the mic. Oh, give him the wireless mic. <laughs> give him the wireless mic. Hold on. How That's, do you want to do this? Yeah, well, yeah, Wait, so no, let's no, no. Put him out looking at the audience. There you go. And give him the wireless mic. <laughs> Uh, so, how many sound engineers does it take? We need more. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, we'll yeah. hear you better in a moment. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna amplify you in just a second. Okay. Do you prefer that I portrait or landscape? We, I portrait, because that's how the <laughs> laptop, the Check one. iPad stands okay. up. Good to see show. you guys. <laughs> hey. 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 So someone will have to tell us if they can hear David on the uh, on the audio for the live stream that's going out on YouTube. This oh, is sure. so weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's super weird. <laughs> so, so for those of you who don't know, David Joseph Wesley is a longtime friend of the show, and he is a composer, lover of science, eclipse chaser. And um, when we mentioned we might need a new theme song at the end of last year, what did you do, David? I said I'm going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he is here as a head in a box. <laughs> What's in the box? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because he's been creating a new theme song, and I'm going to go ahead and play it. Um, Frankenstein threw my phone into this microphone so that you can all hear it 
And, and then I'd love you to tell us all the different inspirations that you put into this, because I caught some of them, but I know there's more. Okay, sure. Okay, I'm gonna turn up my volume and then try that again, sorry. Ah, stop. <laughs> Technology man, I'm telling you. There you go. I know, we're super Frankenstein today. It's yeah, awesome. this yeah. is so much wrong. <laughs> David, somebody uh, cracked up the theremin for that one. Oh, you know what? You would think so. Um, it's going to be on it eventually. Um, <laughs> oh. I, I've got multiple mixes. So that was actually the theremin's little brother. Um, let me see if I can show it to you guys. This might but, be too but much. But thank you so much. That was awesome, by the way. <laughs> I just, I just remember visiting your studio and seeing the theremin and, and getting a we got a chance to actually uh, practice with the theremin. And so uh, I just remember that and thought you might have included it. So did I hear a little bit of Doctor Who influence in that? <laughs> Some Star Trek? There's a little bit of that. There's a little bit of that. There's just kind of just science, sci-fi, astronomy, science in general. Um, a little bit once, once I started working on it I started thinking about the original Alexander Courage Star Trek theme as well yeah um it's just it's got a bunch of different things going on in it for me um and uh let me see here uh oh, I, oh go ahead we didn't say anything okay I think there's an echo <laughs> it's me in my Max Hedrum phase I can't hear what's going on um I think so we're I'm, getting uh, a feedback from the air conditioner Oh, you guys are there? I just, think so. Just I keep hear going. Sound. You're good. Yeah. No, no, I can actually hear you guys pretty clearly. I think it's we're, we're going to have to be kind of in walkie-talkie mode. I think that's how it works. It's like, you know, I can do this, then go over. <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's going to be theremin on it eventually. I have many, many mix ideas. This is the initial mix idea. Um, and uh, there's going to be an orchestral version that I've already started working on. Oh, come uh, on. Just and, stop, man. You did it. You did it. You delivered it. You shipped it. We've got it. We're going to include it. We're mixing it in. It's done. Thank you. But Yeah, you're welcome. And, and of course. <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> Orchestral I can't version. stop. Somebody has to come over here. Yeah, I know. I know. I just told you. Stop. It's too late now. You, you did it. We're using it. It's perfect. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah, then yeah, Metallica is going to uh, yeah, do a version of it. That's the only time we'll, we'll crack it open from the vault again and let someone else work on it. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I am, however, making a longer version that's going to be like song length that people can download. That's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> awesome. And, and if you like this, check out Music to Smuggle by which uh, just might be slightly inspired by a bug-named show that might happen to involve calm emotions for their spaceship title. Um, so, so go check out Music to Smuggle By, also by David Joseph Wesley, and you may have heard his music while wandering around Universal Studios listening to Star Wars movies or tuning in to Family Guy. We could not be more honored to have such an amazing composer work with us to give us a thoroughly original theme song that literally rocks. Woo! Thanks, David. Yeah, thank you, guys. Okay, so you are going out to the audience with Phoenix, and she'll continue to be here throughout the day as a head in a box. Sounds good. So it's great seeing you, David. So earlier I, I asked Phoenix, where is the head in the box? And several people were mortified. You now understand what I was requesting. Now, it, this, this show Definitely is literally a production of... of 
you. Uh, our new logo that is being seen, well, it's our old logo that has been used on iTunes, but hasn't yet been uh, part of our website, hasn't yet been part of many different things, and is going to get pulled in. That is a logo that was done by one of our fans. We now have a theme song that was done by one of you. Um, you guys are slowly taking over everything but our voices, and we, we are happy yeah. and pleased and grateful, and thank you, because this two-day celebration is by you, for you, and we're happy that you invited us to join you. <laughs> now, we do have some door prizes. Now, the first one we have goes to the person or people who traveled the furthest to get here. So, so uh, I know we have North Carolina. Do we have anyone further than North Carolina? Yes. Okay, go ahead. So Noel, Noel and Gordon are both here from Ontario. Bad Panda, where are you from? I'm sorry, I love your username so much that I've just replaced Dusty with that. Dusty, where, where did you come in from? Oh. Winner. Yeah, okay, where did you come in from? <laughs> I, I think San Diego still won. South Carolina is three hours by air. <laughs> so does someone need to Google Maps it or does San Diego win? Wait, we have another hand over there. You do not count, sir. You do not count. <laughs> so come on up, Dusty. Okay, so um, how many of you started listening in 2006? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how many people started listening in September 2006? Oh. Okay, so how many Slacker Astronomy Days people do we have? Kristen, you win for longest listener. Yay. Okay. So now we're going for community awards. How many people uh, were on the bout forums when Astronomy Cast went on. Whoa. We have no one who joined the bout forums. It is the single largest astronomy forums on the internet, and they have a section just for Astronomy Cast that is not used by any of you. <laughs> nope. Uh, the weekly Space Hangout crew? Yeah, but that's a given. They're all here. I don't have that many <laughs> decks of cards. <sighs> okay, I have two more prizes, and you just foiled where I was going with that. Um, were any of you on Google Hangouts in the days when we had 10 slots and we let people join us on air? Morgan, you get a deck of cards. <laughs> and and while it's quite silly, I'm going to give Nancy back her deck of cards for being our first Facebook mod. <laughs> oh yeah. That was so funny. Nancy's like, man, there's a lot of trolls in your Facebook group. I'm like, you're a mod now. <laughs> I believe that's how, yeah, that's how the, the crushing responsibility began, was she noticed that there was a lot of trolls on our Facebook group and then suddenly was upgraded to moderator status. In fact, how many people are moderator status on our various live streams and such? Yeah, yeah. Did I ask any of you for permission to turn you into moderators? No. no. I, more than once, people have showed up in our various streams and suddenly realized they were our mod, and they realized it because they were no longer getting yelled at by auto mod on Twitch. 
So I'm watching as Fraser <laughs> writes the intro for today's <laughs> episode. <laughs> Pay no attention to that. Yeah, it's done. So before we get started, and I'm going to try and like dim in the new music on my phone live. So this might get no, a little bit messy. Don't do it because we, okay, we want fine, this clean fine, audio fine. just for the, for the Okay, can recording. I play it one more time and then we pause and then you read the intro? Sure, if okay. you want. Yeah, whenever we start the I want them recording. to hear his music one more time. One more time. Okay, so are you ready for episode 500? Okay. Astronomy Cast, episode 500, 500 years into the past and future. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, live here in Edwardsville. Dr. Pamela Gay, the Director of Technology and Citizen Science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and the director of CosmoQuest. And here we are live in Edwardsville for Astronomy Cast episode 500. 500 episodes. Pamela, how's it going? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. Good. I, this is the second day of our 500th episode fun here in Edwardsville with a bunch of our closest friends. We did a bunch of events yesterday, a bunch of events today, more coming, live stargazing. Um, that was last night. That was yet last night. <laughs> I remember. I was there. Um, <laughs> And uh, man, it's been so much fun. And we're sort of nearing the end of all of the stuff that we've got planned, right? Well, that just means we're going to have to do another 500 episodes and do this all over again at 1,000, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. 1,000. <laughs> oh, no. it, only, it only took us 13 years to get to here, so I'm in for another 13. No problem. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be body. at least 26 more years before I can retire. So I, 150, we can do it. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, all right, so let's let's get on to this week's this week's episode. So welcome to episode 500 of Astronomy Cast. To celebrate this momentous occasion, we're going to look back 500 years into the past to see what we learned about the universe, and then we're going to cast our minds forward and speculate on what we're going to see up to 500 years into the future. Uh, all right, Pamela. So let's start with the history portion of this episode. So, f so here we are. I'm gonna have to do some quick math. I haven't even done the math here. Uh, so 2018. So would that be 16? It would be 15, 15 18. 18. Yeah, my math is terrible. So it so turns out, if you look up what was the most important event in history in 1518, it was an outbreak of dancing sickness. <laughs> In Strasbourg, people were dropping dead from dancing too really? hard. So apparently it was a kind of interesting but not very scientific year in 1518. And we would need to wait for the science to begin. So let us start by setting the stage. In 1518, we were roughly 1,500 years after Ptolemy. So people were living in a land where everything went round the Earth, where asteroids were not known, where comets were strange demons that possessed the sky, where science was just starting as the Renaissance begins to sweep through Europe. The planets went up to Saturn. True. Yeah. Now, for us and our story of astronomy, 
things would begin to get interesting in 1543 when Copernicus first publishes his heliocentric theory of the universe. And did you actually, have you actually seen sort of the, the history of how this went with Copernicus? Like he didn't make a big deal of it. Just posted a fairly quiet paper that said, oh, by the way, I think the, the sun is at the middle of the solar system and then published it, not wanting to get into trouble. Well, and if you read more, he was also kind of into Apollo and Apollo was the deity of the sun. And so there was a lot of Apollo having to do with this. And I'm mostly good with that. My favorite moment in science was explaining to Richard Hatch that the asteroid that tried to take out Chelyabinsk, Russia, was an Apollo-class asteroid. Right. No one laughed. <laughs> no one the, laughed. The, but the, the thing as well was that the problem with the Copernican model was that it didn't match reality as yeah. well as the Ptolemaic mm -hmm. model. So, so even though he got the big picture stuff right, the fact that the sun is in the middle of the solar system uh, and not the Earth, Ptolemy's predictions about the motions of the planets actually worked out a lot well because they had been thought through over and over again and were needlessly complicated to be able to do that. Uh, so, so let's continue our story forward until we've got a much better sense of, of how the solar system worked. Well, the, the 1500s were an active time where people were finally starting to try and think scientifically. As I said, we're in the age of the Renaissance here. So, so fairly soon, 1572, we're still talking within a human lifetime. Tycho Brahe, uh, he discovers a supernova in in the constellation Cassiopeia. This is the first time that we're starting to make these modern observations. We had lots of, of like super old observations, especially by the Chinese and by Native Americans who carved things in things. Um, but the reason that I bring up Tycho Brahe in particular is because he noticed this supernova because he was outside night after night after night after night after night all the nights he was out there observing very, very precisely the astrometric positions of the planets. And Kepler, who was a kind of indoor kind of a guy, was able to take all of Brahe's observations and start testing all of the mathematics of the models against Brahe's observations. And, and this is the important part. Now, so we have Brahe outside making his observations, and now we have Galileo starts getting involved in 1609. So Brahe is out there literally measuring things against metal things in a slot. So he, no lenses are harmed or enjoyed at this point in science. Now, it would be 1609, roughly 30 years later, or 20, mm, uh, roughly 40 years later, I can math. I took a pain pill before doing this. I mentioned this earlier. I'm going to mention it again for the people who are right. listening on the podcast. Um, and, and with the, the use of a telescope to look at the stars, it started to change what we were able to do. It started to change how we thought about science. Because prior to that, it was all about the sphere. We had the moon was a perfect sphere, and then Galileo looks at it and goes, nope, mountains. We had everything goes around either the sun or the earth, depending on whose argument you're listening to. He looks at Jupiter. Things are going around Jupiter. Galileo basically took a whole lot of science that was based on philosophical arguments and noped it with the beginnings of observational astronomy. I mean, the thing that's really fascinating about Brahe was, as you said, you know, no telescope lenses were done. He had this amazing instrument that was sort of like a sextant that was like a big metal structure and he could measure angles and he was able to essentially map out the positions of the stars and the planets and especially the planets every night, night after night after night with a level of accuracy that had never been accomplished by any astronomer beforehand. And it was this dump of data that Brahe had presented to the astronomical community that gave, as you said, Kepler the tool that he needed to be able to understand what was going on. And the, the key discovery that he made was that it's not all circles. Because this was the assumption that everybody had made that yes, the Earth is 
the earth is in the center of the universe and all of the planets are going and the sun is going around the planet and they're all going in circles and to make the reality match the observations that have been made was that the the planets were going in little circles around the bigger circles and that's how it all lined up it was when kepler looked at the data and said wait a minute they don't have to be going in circles they can be going in ellipses that suddenly you get a better explanation of the motions that we see in the heavens. And, and this was a complicated process for them to get to because they had to keep overcoming their personal biases. And bias gets all of us now and then. So in this case, the, the thing that they were struggling against is they thought the stars were kind of close. And if the Earth is going around the sun and the stars are kind of close, you expect to see the stars moving rel relative to one another as you go around the sun. The same way our motions may appear to make trees move back and forth against background mountains. Nearby houses move against background skyscrapers. This constant change in alignment, change in perspective due to the Earth's motion wasn't something that was happening. And the only way that they could explain that we're not seeing the stars' positions change as the Earth moves is if the stars are immensely further away than anyone had ever imagined before. So they had to expand our universe in their brains and they had to get rid of this idea of a perfect circle. And ellipses are mathematically harder. So you have to also say, expletive it. And add the extra terms to make it an ellipse. So in between the time when Brahe had made his observations and Kepler had finally done the math to figure it out, Galileo was the first person to take this new technology, this telescope and <laughs> pointed at the sky and started to observe the heavens to see what he could see to actually make observations and that also was a really defining point of of modern astronomy and and it always amazes me how all of this was pretty much going on all at once but in very different parts of europe you have kepler up in the land of the protestants and you have galileo annoying the Pope. Uh, and, the Pope. And so Kepler was working on his first and second laws of planetary motion at the same time that Galileo was publishing his initial observations. And it was in 1619 that, that Kepler brought everything together in his Harmonica Mundi. And I, I will translate that for you. It was his Harmony of Worlds book with all three laws. And next year is the anniversary of that. So from 1619 to, well, 2019, we have 500 years to celebrate, 400 years to celebrate. Yeah, whose math is I know, falling I apart know. now? I took a pain pill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, just keep blaming that the whole episode. Yes. Uh, I should take one too, and then we'll just be the same. <laughs> no one's going to be driving this ship. Um, so, so with with Galileo, he got all the first early big discoveries because he was the first person to point that telescope at the sky. Oh, yeah. He saw that Venus makes a crescent. He saw that, I th um, th of course, discovered the moons of Jupiter, discovered the rings of Saturn, although he thought they were the ears of Saturn, <laughs> pointed a telescope at the moon and saw all of the craters and the, the mare, the seas of lava, um, and pointed his telescope into the Milky Way and saw that it was full of stars, that it wasn't just some cloud that was up there in the sky. All of these fell to, to Galileo, and it was just such low-hanging fruit. I mean, I guess it, to think that nobody had really done these kinds of careful observations is amazing. Any one of us would have been like, oh, wait a minute, what, if you look at the sky, what would it look like? But... But the thing we have to remember is they didn't really have machine tools back yeah. then. And, and they didn't have lasers for collimation. And, and so these are individuals who are hand grinding their lenses, hand aligning everything. And, and they've got like wood and forges and stone. And it wasn't the dark ages, it was the Renaissance. Right. But it was 
for making future discoveries, it was who can build the better instrument by hand. And so now we start to reach this amazing new era of the gentleman scholar, the human being who's able to afford the leisure time to build that great observatory or, or just good enough observatory. Christian Huygens was going to come next in 1656 where he is able to finally make sense of Saturn's ears and go, no, 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 no. That is a ring that is passing around Saturn. And he also noticed that Saturn, too, has, well, its fourth moon, Titan. Uh, so, and last night, when we did the star party portion of this uh, 500th episode of Astronomy Cast, uh, there was a whole bunch of telescopes set up. And they, in those telescopes, we were able to see the rings of Saturn and Titan and in some of the more powerful ones, we were able to see another moon. I don't know which moon it was. It was Rhea, okay. Yeah. Uh, so we were able to, so that view that we were seeing in those telescopes last night was roughly the same view in the smaller telescopes that were just seeing Titan. That was essentially the view that Huygens was making to be able to see his first observations and, and make those detailed discoveries about Saturn. But we were still seeing so much better because Huygens wasn't able to make out the, the gap in the rings. He was just be able to go, oh, rings. He, he was the first one to start noticing these fine features. Uh, he went on to realize that Mars wasn't just a solid color disk. It was a disk that had variations in colors. He went on to figure out that... Um, well, actually, it wasn't Huygens, I'm sorry. It was another Saturn-related human. It was Cassini that then went on to one-up Huygens and in 1666 realized Mars has polar ice caps. Now, up until then, like, they hadn't even really figured out Earth that well. <laughs> so we're looking at 1666. Uh, they knew America existed and I'm just going to leave it at that. And they know that there's polar ice caps on Mars. How amazing is that? And again, this sort of matches in the largest telescopes that we could see last night in the star party. You could just make out those polar ice caps on, on Mars. Um, and with the, with the largest telescope, I was able to make out the Cassini division in the rings of Saturn named after Cassini. And now you're jumping ahead to 1675 yes. and totally bypassing the work that Newton did. Well, I thought I would just come back around after we okay, mentioned fine, that just fine. with the capabilities. <laughs> right. And so Newton, of course, in, in that exact same period, revolutionized the telescopes by inventing an entirely new kind of telescope. When I guess he wasn't stabbing his own eyeball with a needle to see how the off Knitting break. needle. Yeah, with a knitting needle to see how his, to see how his eye worked, um, figuring out how rainbows worked, all of this stuff. Uh, he invented the reflecting telescope, which was, again, almost all the telescopes we were using last night were these Newtonian reflector telescopes. Essentially the same design that, Newton, that Newton had figured out 400 years ago. Now, what, what you should start to be seeing with all of this is we have hand in hand people who are going, I'm going to observe all of this stuff. And people, often the same people, saying, I'm going to math all this stuff. It was Galileo who figured out momentum, who figured out friction. It was Newton who figured out that gravity is what is causing Kepler's laws to Kepler's law. And, and so we're starting to build this modern version of astrophysics uh, where it's math and observation coming together to map out reality. And, and this is how it's going to continue happening, going back and forth. 1687, we have gravity. Once, we, well, okay, we already had gravity, let's face that. That yeah. came out like within a gazillionth of a second of the universe forming. Right, but, <laughs> but it, Newton at least started to figure out how gravity worked. And once we have gravity as a, like a complete theory, you start to be able to figure out highly elliptical orbits, have start figuring out how bigger planets are able to screw up the orbits of littler things. And this starts changing how you think about motions in our solar system. And in 1705, Halley of Halley's Comet is able to start figuring out that these 
bright, streaky, tailed objects that we sometimes see. There's a green one out there you can see right. with binoculars right now. These are repeating objects, at least in the case of Halley's Comet. But the, the thing that I love about Newton's discovery about gravity is that he looked at, like, and of course, the, the story is, of course, that he dropped an apple. Who's to say whether it really, <laughs> really happened? But he thought about the way an apple falls from a tree and knew that that was the same thing that was causing the moon to go around the, around the earth and to make that logical leap. I wouldn't think of it, but no. you know, Newton's a very smart person. Um, but and just to creative. And, cre and creative. And so, and to realize that the moon was falling into the earth, but it was also moving sideways. And so it was missing and it was just constantly falling and missing and falling and missing. And it is this, this, and this is why it's this universal theory of gravity that tied all of these pieces together and served as the bedrock for hundreds of years of observations and understanding about the universe from that point forward. And, and during this period is where we start having all of your amateurs, people not too distant, different from those of you in this room. I see at least one person who built his own telescope and I think ground his own mirror. And it was these individuals who were building their own telescopes. And as they skipped from one known star to one known star, they were finding fuzzy objects in between and mapping them out. And this is where we had Messier. This is where we had the Herschels. This is where we had an explosion of catalogs that began to allow us to realize our heavens are more than just points of light. And it's also when we had our first planet that would be demoted. This was, I am, as some of you know, Team Ceres. In 1801... Did you catch Uranus? Well, okay, I was going to skip Uranus because, well, it was just Herschel doing his Herschel-y thing. In 1781, Herschel found a planet. He was, uh, by training, a composer, an oboist. He uh, led the orchestra in Bath. Um, and, yeah, he found a planet in his spare time, as yeah. you do. <laughs> right. Um, and the, the crazy part of that is that Uranus is just visible with the unaided eye if you know where to look and you've got really good vision. And so it didn't necessarily require Herschel to discover it. Any, uh, anyone back at that time with the right vision would have, could have seen it in the right conditions, but it, but it still took somebody with a telescope to see it and confirm it. And, and the amount of stubborn required to do it by yeah. eye, because the vastness of the sky and it moves slowly but and it's the same process that's going now i mean we'll talk about neptune in a bit pluto all of the dwarf planets that are out there all of the kuiper belt objects and of course the search for planet nine to this day it's all the same technique scanning the plane of the ecliptic searching for anything that is moving slowly and, and for Herschel, he was already looking for things that were moving. He was looking for comets, and Uranus just refused to grow a tail. Now, I will point out that if you took Pluto and you put it where Mercury is located, it would happily grow a tail. So take that. We're, we are not getting into that fight here. <laughs> that, was, that was episode one. That was 500 <laughs> episodes ago. We've left that, we've left that in, the, in, in the dust. Um, but then you were talking about Ceres. Yeah, so 1801, we find this, not we, we were not alive. Uh, Piazzi discovers this new small world that was located between Mars and Jupiter. And, and this is where people start looking at the ratios of the distances of the planets and, hey, this is cool, but it didn't stay cool for long because we just kept finding new objects after new objects until they eventually decided to demote Ceres. Oh, and this is, of course, they found a bunch more of these asteroids. I think there was eventually four major ones, five major ones, and they realized that they couldn't just keep calling them planets because that would just freak people out. They'd be like, no, seven planets in my solar system, and, you know, they're not going to have eight 
or 9 or 12 or 13 or again we can't escape this argument um, but uh, yeah this this technique of expecting that there's going to be a planet in the outer the outer solar system observing thanks to the interactions of gravity thanks to these predictions made by Newton helped astronomers find the next planet. So once we found Uranus, Uranus just did not behave the way it was supposed to. And, and so people started mathing it. Now, there are arguments among astronomical historians over, to exact, over exactly how this story went. I'm not going to get into those arguments, but I will say that Johann Galle observed Neptune in 1846 and brought us yet one more planet that was still not quite behaving the way our early pre-computer, pre-database, pre-mathematical models of all sorts of computational complexity, uh, Neptune appeared to not be fully behaving, so they kept looking. Right, right. And I, do we want to fast forward to that part or do we want to cover some of the other objects? Well, and so right now we're at a point where we have, uh, we're finding in 1877 Phobos and Deimos orbiting Mars. We're starting to understand understand um, the atom better and better in the late 1800s. It was only in the late 1800s that we started to have the electromagnetic force. We started trying to realize what photons are doing, the wave particle duality arguments, all of these things that we've done entire episodes in Astronomy Cast during the past, how many have we done? Uh, 500? That maybe? sounds about right. Yeah. Apparently that's not the right number. There's 537 <laughs> with the question shows. Nine, 539. 539? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this, forget it. We're just, we made a terrible mistake. We should have done this 39 episodes ago. You know, we should have fixed this back in 2006. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the ga the gal was it the Julian calendar in the, uh, right? Oh, that was more than 500 yeah, years ago. Yeah. You went back too yeah, far we now. Have, we could have followed that same <laughs> method. Just redone the math. Um, so I think one thing that we sort of slightly skipped over, and it's more core to astronomy itself, is the understanding that the light coming from stars can be broken up into, like a rainbow, into its individual chemical components. They were able to set things on fire here on Earth, see what kind of light that gave off, then look at stars and compare the light and realize that you can tell what a star is made of by the kind of light that it gives off and the way you can break that up. This is, of course, spectroscopy and it is the the Swiss Army knife, the most important tool that a lot of astronomers have at their disposal. And the crazy thing about how they did this originally. So it, this, this wasn't the first time that light got put through a prism. Herschel put light through a prism. It was just sunlight. He discovered infrared radiation this way because he put his thermometer outside the visible rainbow and it still went up in temperature, which told him it wasn't actually in the shade. Now it was in the infrared radiation. Now, <sighs> Unfortunately, we didn't develop cameras, photographic techniques, until after we developed the spectrograph. I say unfortunately because we weren't able to record any of those first spectra that helped us understand that, well, stars are just hot balls of gas. And, and so in the 1860s, spectral analysis began, and we started figuring out both in the lab and at the telescope what things are made of one spectra at a time. Um, so now we're like closing into the 20th century of, of history and it's kind of amazing to think that here we are uh, only 100 years later a lot of the major discoveries we're going to talk about next that that they've only unfolded in a hundred years, less. We are, we just lost our, our banner there. Um, we are like, so much of our knowledge, so much of human history has been around and, and yet he, a lot of the modern ideas that we have about astronomy are brand new compared to the history of science and the history of humanity. It's amazing. And, and one of the things that up until I was prepping for this episode really bothered me is people have been saying my entire adult life that we're in a brand new renaissance of astronomy. And then I thought about it while prepping this show and realized the renaissance were a couple hundred years old and I'm not. And so it's 
ballad that the, for the couple of decades that I can say I've been pretending to adult, we've been continually in a renaissance of astronomy. This is due to all of the amazing computational abilities we have. But this is just building on the early renaissance of the entire last century as we started to get photography, as we started to mathematically understand quantum mechanics, relativity, and be able to realize that our universe is more than just our galaxy and that those fuzzy nebulas that we see in some cases are star-forming regions and in other cases are complete other galaxies. Yeah, I've, I've mentioned this past, I have a... Uh, I have a planisphere from the 1930s, and it has the Andromeda Nebula yeah. in it. And so people even then thought that Andromeda was a nebula and not a galaxy. They weren't entirely certain. Uh, where do you want to pick up the history here? Well, I, I think we're now at the point where we have to start grouping discoveries. Yeah. And, and what gets me is it's just over 100 years ago, back in 1914, that rocketry for the purposes of launching things towards space versus launching things at other people as like missiles and arrows. Or um, fireworks. Or fireworks. Yeah. Uh, Robert Goddard in 1914 started launching rockets, liquid-fueled rockets. And at the time that he started doing this, we started dreaming of space telescopes. So we're now hitting the modern era where we have people beginning to think about air flight, and we get this mixing of the brand new field of aerospace and the people who are dreaming of the stars and science fiction all coming into this great new era of creativity. And if you go back and you read some of the older works, you have Ray Bradbury in particular telling stories of Mars based on Chaparral's discovery of the canals where he imagines amazing civilizations and vast forests and, well, wow, we were wrong, but it's amazing to dream through these writers' eyes. Uh, and then, of course, the, it was the, the Mount Wilson Observatory that was created by Wilson to try to find evidence of the canals on that Mars. That was Lowell Observatory. Was Lowell Observatory, sorry, yeah. The Lowell Observatory to find evidence of the, uh, of the, the Martians' last stand trying to prevent the climate change on their planet as their oceans and seas were drying up and they were building these vast canals on the planet to try and herd all the water to their... He was just writing science fiction about our planet, wasn't he? With a tel yeah, exactly, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but had built a very powerful telescope to, uh, to try and uh, prove this, this evidence. Now, as, as we move forward, we're, we're hitting at this period also the age of, well, computers, and in this case, I mean the women working at Harvard College Observatory. <laughs> uh, doing mathematics wasn't considered something that men did. It was women sat down and did all that long, hard, tedious calculations, um, which gets me when they're now like, math isn't for girls. No, math was actually originally for girls. It was the original science for right. us. Math is for computers and computers are girls. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think Siri's voice is a woman's? <laughs> um, that's totally not true. I'm just, nah, I'm making a bad joke. Um, so, so we had Henriette Henrietta Swan Levet in 1908 uh, discovered Cepheid variables. We, we had uh, Annie Jump Cannon doing her work on stellar classifications. We had so many amazing discoveries being made by this small group all put together in one place. And when those men went away for World War I, they got a whole lot of work done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now that idea of the Cepheid variables, that you've got this star that is a set amount of brightness intrinsically based on the, how quickly it, it grows and dims or brightens and dims, gave astronomers this cosmic yardstick, a way to be able to independently measure the distance to anywhere they could see a Cepheid variable. And suddenly they were able to notice that there were these Cepheid variables variables in other nebulae <laughs> <laughs> that actually help them calculate the distance to these other 
nebulae. So at, at this point early on in the, the 1900s, we philosophically think that our universe is unchanging with time. It is a steady state system where we have Einstein, De Sitter, all of these other, well, big names that those of you who took graduate school physics have been forced to use the calculations of, uh, they put together our model of the universe and then added in staying variables. This is that cosmological constant that originally was put in um, to make the expansion stop. Because the universe is clearly, all the parts are attracting each other by gravity. They should have just gravitationally just sucked into a ball. Or expanded away or forever. Or expanded or drifted away from each other. Why are they there? There must be some constant force that's keeping everything in its position. Well, not necessarily a force. It could just be that everything happens to be balanced out precisely. Right. And it, it started with initial set of spectral observations of galaxies. It was made of Lowell Observatory that prior to us having the ability to measure the distances to galaxies showed that galaxies weren't moving in completely random rates, but on average tended to be moving away from us. If we lived in a static, unmoving universe, you'd expect some of the galaxies to be moving towards us, some of us, some of them moving away, just, just the random buzz of galaxies back and forth and around. And when Hubble followed up at, on this at Mount Wilson Observatory and started using Henrietta Levette Cepheid period luminosity relationship to measure distances, a trend began to appear. And it was uh, Lemaitre who uh, initially wrote a paper in French that worked out that our universe is expanding and made the first ever attempt to calculate the rate of that expansion, a value that we now call the Hubble constant, which may be weird, but the problem is, did I mention he published in French? Yeah, and well, we, and we covered this, this, this last week in, in great detail. Yes. <laughs> the, but maybe at some point it's going to be turned into the Hubble Lemaitre law? I, I think so. I think in about three months we're voting on this. <laughs> What's your vote going to be? My vote is going to be yes, change that. Right on. So, so now we're entering the age of understanding our universe is expanding and needing to understand more physics and more math. And now we have quantum mechanics coming into regular play. And we're starting to understand what powers stars. At the beginning of the 1900s, people were like running calculations assuming if the sun were made out of coal, how long would it last? And we were getting numbers that had the sun couldn't have lived as long as the mountains. And that is a problem. But then in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, we began to understand uh, nuclear fission, fusion, alpha, beta, gamma. All of them are working on their various papers, and Eddington is describing stars, and it's discovery after discovery after discovery. Thus, the we live in the renaissance of astronomy. The, the first renaissance as opposed to the one we live in right now. And so, then there was the 1970s. <laughs> right. Was that particle physics resonance? Anyway, so, so just imagine now, suddenly we are in this world where we can calculate the distance of these galaxies. These galaxies, as Hubble discovered, are actually moving away from us. The stars that make up these galaxies are not made of coal. They are made of, which would be weird when you think <laughs> about it, that they are actually made of balls of hydrogen gas that are undergoing fusion that's pumping out the, the, the light and heat that we see and feel. Um, that that our understanding that where we are in this universe is that we are on a much smaller speck in a much vaster cosmos than we ever had originally imagined. And this is where we enter our new modern age where we finally have all of the forces, not nailed down, but identified. We begin to realize there's dark matter with the work of uh, Vera Rubin. We uh, didn't figure out dark energy until 1998. That one's a little bit more recent. 
But we have our modern universe. Coming out of World War II, we rearranged where the scientists live, put them into different uh, politically defined nests of great uh, research being done. Is that is that are you are you saying that the that the Nazis from World War II were broken up into two camps? Some went to the United States, some went to the, uh, Soviet Russia, and I might began be the, that. Uh, yes. the space. And so, I mean, this is the thing: we discovered our place in the universe, and now suddenly we had the ability to actually get out there and explore this universe that we now understood more about. And, and now our discovery is being driven by how well can we build our instruments, how much money do we have is a major limiting factor, and where is the next great creative mind, the next Newton, Einstein, Chandrasekhar, who's going to come along and figure out, well, can gravity get tied into anything? Is there an experiment to figure out if it's geometric or particle? What is this dark energy thing? And, and so we need that creative mind, we need that budget for the instrumentation, and and now we're moving into the future. Uh, well, did you want to do? You want to skip the space flight portions of this uh, history of astronomy? Didn't we do a whole series about we, that two we, years ago? We really did. <laughs> but I mean, I, I mean, just I mean, you talked about some of the cosmology components. I mean, yeah. there were quasars discovered, and only recently they figured out what those things are. We mentioned there's pulsars that there are dying uh, neutron stars that were that were discovered as as blasting radio waves. Black holes were theorized in the early part of the 20th century, observed or sort of secondhand yeah. in the la in the mid in the, by the 70s with like the X1 Cygnus X1. Cygnus X1, and then the supermassive black holes figured out by the end of the 20th century, which then answered what quasars were, which had been ob first observed decades beforehand. And, and what's kind of amazing about all of this is now we're starting to get into the discoveries within our adulthood, and yeah. we're kind of young. Planets weren't known when we finished high school outside of our own solar system, and now we know they're kind of everywhere unless you look in globular clusters. Uh, we didn't know supermassive black holes were there, and then we thought they were everywhere, and now they, we know that they're wherever there's a bulge. So look for the bulge, look for the supermassive black hole. If it's a disk with no bulge, no black hole. These are all new discoveries and still not firmly set in stone. Uh, 1995 was the first planet that was discovered. 51 peg yep. in, uh, you know, a, and, and completely redefined our understanding of what a planet was because it was a hot Jupiter, an object that should not have been able to exist. And yet they found it and then found many others of that example. Uh, and it's only been in more recent times that astronomers have finally been able to find planets that are more like our own planet. And even while we're, and this is where we're going to move into the future, uh, we have not found an analog to Earth yet out we there. We keep getting headlines saying we have. Yeah. But that's because that sells papers. So let's, let's move into the future and let, let's start to speculate a little bit. So, so where we are now in terms of planetary discoveries, there are probably close to 10,000 exoplanets discovered. I forget the exact number of changes. In fact, by the time we finish this podcast, it'll be it'll another be number. Uh, we have the TESS spacecraft, which has launched, which is already, I believe, turned up something like 50 planets this morning. I've heard there's like 50 planets in the data so far. Um, and we're going to be hearing more about this. But when do you think that we're going to find that analog to Earth. We're going to find that Earth-like planet orbiting a sun-like star within the habitable zone. I, I think it's going to take at least three more years because you need that long to get three full Earth orbits around an Earth-like star. So we need something to go out there and get that full chance to see an Earth go around an Earth-like star at an Earth-like distance three full times. So we need a Tess-like thing, a Gaia-like thing out there taking data for three full years. Um, and they're launched, so three years? Yeah, Kepler would have been, the, the Kepler Observatory was the one that should have found it, but then it's 
uh, gyros broke down. <laughs> Um, and so it uh, was only able to do observations of red dwarf stars. But I've heard rumors that those obs that th that discovery may be sooner than the three years waiting for tests to make the observatory that 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 existing observ there are so many ground based observatories that will have possibly already found yeah. this other Earth that we might not have to wait uh, for the three years for it to to come up but but probably three years at the most is when we're going to find confirmation of earth 2.0 and so the question that's left that we don't know is what is the probability of life forming so we're getting so close to actually being able to experimentally figure out all the variables in that Drake equation, which we did an entire episode on, because what haven't we done an yeah, entire episode yeah. on? And so we're down to that point of we know the star formation rates. We're starting to understand the planet formation rates. And what we're now missing is all those variables related specifically to life. The one I don't want to figure out is the how long does a civilization last before it kills itself? <laughs> right. um, Let me just do the math. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but if we can start to figure out how often has bacterial life cropped up in our own solar system, and this is where we start just realizing how many more robots we need to go send out to other worlds. Well, there's three fascinating methods that are being used to try and answer this very scientific question is, are we alone in the universe? The, the one, as you mentioned, you've got the, the Curiosity rover um, is looking for past evidence on Mars, but following that is going to be the Mars 2020 rover, which is going to have the capability to find evidence of past life on Mars in various, in various forms. But then you've also got, of course, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is ramping up and listening to signals of, from, from space, waiting to hear the aliens talk to us. You have METI. You have METI, yeah. The and folks of course, are sending the messages to the You've got WETI, of course, the people who are waiting, waiting for extraterrestrial intelligence. But, the, but probably the most fruitful method that we've got at our disposal is James Webb, which is going to be launching in 2021, it's going to have the capability to directly observe the atmospheres of Earth-sized worlds around other star systems. And in theory, um, it should be able to detect some of the biosignatures that will be out there in some of these other worlds and give us some kind of, of evidence that there could very well be life around another star system, another planet around another star system. And, and so as we look into the future, Looking back at everything that we've done going from, well, the dancing sickness of Strasbourg in 1518 through to the discovery of lenses, the use of mathematics to model our reality and the idea that observation and theory go hand in hand and philosophy is really a different study that you don't use to define the reaction, the, uh, well, which equation is the right one. Uh, we have come so far in 500 years, I don't know where to begin in imagining 500 years from right. today. Well, we, we, you may have noticed we already started. Um, so we <laughs> talked about planets, we talked about sort of the searching for this, this Earth-sized but world. I think we're still talking about the next 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll f f start with the first next 20, and then we'll move. Then we'll get crazy and, <laughs> and speculative. But there was one other piece. Of, so, so James Webb is going to be launching in 2021. Following, he says that with such certainty. It will absolutely, no question, launch in 2021. No doubt. But... If James Webb doesn't launch, that's fine. Uh, it's not fine, but, but we will still get the data because there is a set of enormous telescopes being built around the world right now. Um, there is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is going on in Chile. There is the, uh, the Giant Magellan Telescope, the 30-meter telescope, and then the monster of them all, the extremely large telescope, which I believe is ex expected to see first light in 2026. Those last three observatories I mentioned, all of which will be capable of observing planets going around other stars. And, and so we're going to be making these direct observations. It, it may not be the pretty shiny artists' renditions that we see when we click on various press releases and visit sites like Universe Today, which none of you have ever been to, right? 
<laughs> um, so, so what we're going to be seeing instead is spectral signatures. Uh, we're going to be seeing little tiny blops in interference patterns indicating where the planets are. But we're going to be seeing them and observing them. And this is the amazing future that's coming. Following those telescopes, there's a next round of space telescopes, which, of course, are absolutely 100% going to launch. No. The one that I'm most... Ex there, there is the HabX, which is the Habitable Exoplanet Finder, and that's going to be... Its only job is going to be to observe Earth-sized worlds around sun-like stars out there. So we have to find them, and then this telescope, which is expected to launch by 2035. Of course, that's not going to happen on schedule. But it'll be the it'll be the, the the better instrument to do it. And following that, or or maybe around the same time, is going to be the Louvoir Telescope, the large ultraviolet infrared optical observatory, which will be a 15 to 18 meter space telescope. And and I, I actually had a chance to to interview the one of the project managers for this. And they believe that Louvoir will, allow, the capability of Louvoir will give us a 90% answer about whether or not there's life in the Milky Way. Dang. Right? That you're going to have a, you're going to be able to see with Louvoir, again, a telescope that is bigger than the biggest telescope that's ever been launched, uh, that's, that exists on Earth, but it'll be in space. It will be able to tell us, it'll be able to observe so many worlds with such capability that if it doesn't find life within that sphere that it can observe, that it means there probably isn't any other life in the Milky Way, probably isn't any other life in the universe. And that will finally be this scientific question that we will know the answer to, which is, a, again, a, a mind-bending possibility. And that's, of course, 2035. So we're only like 15 years, 18 years away from that happening. And here's where I point out in 88, we thought we were a couple of years away from that garbage collector. Right. So, so... The thing that we need most in order to see this new fantastic future is that heavy lift vehicle that's going to be getting these new massive observatories of the future into space. And this is where we need to see more money going to science, more human creativity. I'm going to keep using that phrase because that is the real thing that matters. All of this energy, both human and like solar, wind, all of the actual electron moving energy uh, going into developing these systems and launching these new spacecraft up to explore our solar system and beyond. And, and I mean, obviously people are all very familiar with what's happening with SpaceX, that they are pioneering this idea that you don't have to throw your rocket away every time you use it. Uh, the, of course, the, they've now demonstrated, I don't even know how many times, I've lost count dozens of times that you can launch a rocket and recover the first stage. The Falcon Heavy recovered the side boosters. They're in the works for, for launching the BFR, which is going to be taking off next year, flying around the moon. I don't know. Uh, it's the future again. Um, but it's not just SpaceX. You've got a, a true, in theory, space race with what's happening with Blue Origin and their plans to build reusable rockets as well as well as what NASA is working on with the space launch system, with the space launch system which, which is be, not reusable, which is not reusable. No, and they're taking this beautiful uh, rocket engines, these RS-25s that launch on the space shuttle and they're just destroying them with each launch. It's, it's going to be so sad. Um, but you are going to have the most powerful rocket that's ever been built, capable of launching the most heavy payloads that have ever been devised into space. And these are all, the, all of these rocket systems are going to come online over the next decade. So again, we're not even 500 years into the future. We're still just talking about the next couple of decades. Now, if you want to imagine what society looks like that 500 years from now, what do you want to see? Well, I mean, it's, it's because, you know, if the BFR, if these rockets work and you get true reusability at vast scales, what it makes sense to launch into space just becomes ridiculous. That you're going to launch, we were, we were actually just talking about this last night, about the kinds of clouds of communication satellites that SpaceX and other groups are, are planning. There's going to be multiple competing high-speed internet 
uh, solutions just thanks to space. And again, just in the next couple of decades. Just imagine, play that forward, the infrastructure that we're going to have in the solar system, that we're going to have the ability to uh, communicate across the solar system, we're going to have uh, mining, asteroids, bringing materials back to Earth and keeping it in space where it belongs uh, f far, far into the future. So it's really, it's about building that infrastructure over, I th and I think that's going to be the key word for those next 500 years is going to be infrastructure. And, and what I'm looking to is being able to stick things in those transfer orbits so that you constantly have the ability to get from Earth to Mars uh, that you have the transfer orbits out to the further out worlds as well. And just asteroid after asteroid, take your long journey. Instead of the Siberian Express, it's the Europa Express. And imagine taking that gap year to go visit Jupiter. Yeah. Um, uh Telescopes, I mean, you know, we're imagining things like the Louvoir telescope, but there's a really special place in the solar system about a thousand astronomical units away from the sun where you can use the sun itself as a natural telescope and you can use the gravity of the sun to focus the light from distant objects. And if you positioned a telescope at that 1000 AU, you could see objects like the size of a house on planets orbiting other stars because of that gravitational lens. So again, it seems perfectly reasonable when you've got all of this capability to launch stuff that we'll start to set up those telescopes out at these, at these special points and be able to start observing worlds with high resolution. You just have to wait 8,000 minutes for the signal to get back. Right, I'm willing to wait. <laughs> yeah, I'll be in my third robot body by that time. <laughs> he might be, don't I, laugh. Yeah, don't laugh, it's happening. Uh, um, so now there's a few of these really fundamental concepts that, that astronomers are struggling with. The big mysteries of the day, what is dark matter? What is dark energy? How long do you think that it's going to take for those to be solved? Will they ever be solved? I, I suspect dark matter will get sorted out before dark energy because we're already so close. Uh, if you look at the folks who are looking at collisions between galaxy clusters, they're able to begin to put, uh, well, constraints on the size and collision probabilities of the kinds of particles that could be dark matter. So it may not be a matter that we can, well, catch dark matter in one of these detectors we have on Earth that's looking for them. But rather, we are able to narrow down what they are and say, this invisible object would have the following observational properties were we able to lock it in a box and observe it. Uh, I think we're not too far from getting there. Now, the more interesting thing is, dark energy, the Hubble constant, all of this we're finding more and more confusion between the measurements using local universe measurements and error bars and early universe and error bars measurements. And I want to believe we're going to figure that out in the next generation of telescopes. Right. Because you've got two accurate measurements, mm -hmm. both of which are, their error bars are not overlapping. Right. Both are perfectly confirmed, and yet both disagree with each other. Yes. Yeah. That's astronomers. By just enough to tell us we probably screwed something up. Right. Astronomers are a little upset about this. Very. Yeah. It's a mystery. <laughs> um one of the but uh, one of the parts that i think we who grew up on star wars star trek all of this science fiction future is we want to be living not just here on earth we want to have other we want to be able to visit other star systems and that's one that i wonder if we will make with our 500 year time frame that we mentioned here only if we're putting ourselves to sleep or we find a way to get into the other dimensions of space. And, and this is the thing, it, it's, you can't, because you have stuff that you're made of, move faster than the speed of light. You can appear to move faster away from something than the speed of light because space itself is getting bigger, but that's not you moving. That's more space ending up between you and that other thing you're looking at. 
but there are interesting ideas that come from quantum mechanics. Particles can jump from A to B. It's more a matter of their wave function decides, I shall be maximum here. Nope, I shall be maximum over here. And, and so the question starts to become, can we either tunnel quantum mechanically? Can we jump through other dimensions? Can we? And, and my intellect is going, no. no, no. But my stomach is going, please. If I asked you all going, those questions please, from, my, from 500 episodes of experience, I know you would shut that down. But, but the part of me that desperately wants the free time to take part in NaNoWriMo in November yep. is like, I want all of those things. Which, which of them would you like the best? I want to Stargate. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to. I want to walk to other planets. I, I, or not so much a Stargate because there you're stepping out onto the planet and there could be things waiting there to eat you. Uh, the original, not original, the 1980s Buck Rogers where they had the Stargates that you flew through or the Babylon 5 Stargates right. that you flew through. But you could see what's on the other side. I want a gate through yeah. space. Yeah, that would be awesome. A wormhole. Uh, so a lot of those ideas, do you think that we will know what caused the Big Bang or what was before the Big Bang? So I'm, I'm one of those scientists that is on the side of, uh, no, time is an arrow that goes in one direction. And there's some mysteries that science in our observable universe just can't get to. Do you think inflation will be proven to be true i'm i'm not sure and this is because i don't know how big our universe is if our universe is sufficiently small and finite in size and we keep observing the cosmic microwave background better and better and better one of the most amazing discoveries i don't think we're going to make is seeing two patches of the cosmic microwave background that are enough the same that we can say that's the same piece of, of space that we're seeing from, well, light going different directions. It's the light from the eyes and the back of the head both reaching us. Right. Um, if we get there, that might make everything else a little bit easier, but I don't think we're going to observe that. And that whole idea of, you know, like the bicep two observation that, that they thought they had seen primordial gravitational waves, and then it turns out it was dust. Now they're building a much better instrument to take another crack at seeing those primordial yeah. gravitational waves. You don't think that these new observations will necessarily find it? Because that will, in theory, be evidence of inflation, right? I, I guess at a certain level, I am worried about how can we get all, we don't fully have dust and magnetic fields and all this other junk in our universe mapped out. It's, it's at the level where people still raise questions of, are these galaxies the color we think they are, or is there just so much interstellar reddening that it's screwing us up? No. We, yes, we may be able to get there someday, but not now. Will we integrate gravity and quantum mechanics? I don't know. I, like, so the most like I know that's the answer for all these questions. Well, so, right? so the most amazing answer to me would be um, that we were able to somehow show that gravity isn't conducted by a particle, that it is actually space itself is, is warped by the influence of gravity, just as Einstein worked to explain it, and then all the other forces are like, yeah, we've got bosons. I, I, gravitons are probably gonna prove out, but we, we, I don't know, that would be the more amazing result. Right, gravitons would overthrow a lot of the existing theories of everything. Or they're required for a lot of theories, too. <laughs> right, I, right, it's, he said, more theories than theorists. Uh, and, and again, there's a difference between me saying scientifically, I am not allowed to know, and me as a human being who reads science fiction saying, yeah. the more interesting result would be, but that doesn't mean it's probable. It just means it would make for a cooler story. Are there any other discoveries that you're thinking we will sort out? Because, I mean, obviously we can't know all the things that we don't know. And so it, when we send the Europa probe and it digs down below the ice and and 
makes its observations when the Louvoir telescope comes online, it makes observations when James Webb sees the first galaxies forming, all these questions are going to, going to pop up. But are there any questions that exist right now that you think will get sorted out into the future? Uh, that I, I haven't already <laughs> mentioned. <laughs> there, there was an illustration I saw a number of years ago that I wish I had saved better. I, it was an illustration that came out of one of the NASA astrobiology centers that showed a artist's idea of beneath the ice on Europa, and it had jellyfish and sea cucumbers, and Europan my whales. first thought was, how did anyone at NASA get that approved? That's awesome. My second thought was, I want that to be real. I don't think there's space whales. I want there to be space whales. I don't think there are space whales. Again, the one who likes science fiction versus the one who does science are competing inside me. <laughs> uh, I, I, I desperately, desperately want there to be thermal vents on Europa that are teeming with life. And I think we have the capacity, not necessarily in our lifetime, because sterility is a hard thing to figure out, but I think that's something in the next 500 years we'll figure out. And I hope we also have a linguistics breakthrough to go with it that allows us to better understand how to communicate with the animals on our own world and the potential life we find elsewhere. So 500 years. We can talk to dolphins. 40 episodes a year. <laughs> Is that 20,000 more episodes that we're going to do? We're going to need more than three robot bodies. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to get as many of those episodes done as I can. Uh, side by side, Pamela. Thank you, everyone, for five hundred episodes of your support and watching us. Pamela, thank you for continuing to show up every time and answer all my stupid questions. Um, it's been an honor and a pleasure and here's to thousands more episodes. Oh, there we go. Thanks everyone. All right. Now, what we always do when we do the live show is we do a QA. So I figure, why don't we do a QA with the folks who are here, as well as the people I know are watching uh, online with us right now. Uh, so if anyone's got any questions for us, please. Uh, now, I think there's a mic that's going to be rolling around. So please do wait for the mic so the people who are out on the internet are able to hear Will your questions. Will we ever questions. figure out how to make that banner not fall no. down? No. And At this point, yeah, she's run out of tape in all the universe. And, and I didn't have a chance to say anything because you closed the episode. It's amazing working with you. And, and we have learned so much from each other over the years because we have completely complementary skills. And, and we owe, like, Phil Plate dinner <laughs> <laughs> at least for 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 picking the hosts of astronomy cast so thank you for letting me work with you letting me watch your kids grow up and just being there to shoot the shit in the middle of the night while we figure out how to keep the show going for so many years awesome all right so has anyone got any questions for us bob uh, hi, hi. I, I really enjoy your your astronomy cast. Uh, my question is: There's been some publicity recently about Star Wisp or the star, uh, the the laser driven or the microwave driven sure. uh, micro probes uh, to go to other stars. And the episode you had not too far back, uh, he said that the the prototypes aren't too far away and they would be used to explore the solar system. What's, uh, how, how soon is that going to happen? So, so you're talking about the interview that I did with Avi Loeb from the Breakthrough Foundation and from yeah. the, 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 the live interview that I did with him? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So he, he said that the development of the Breakthrough Starshot is a lot more developed than I think a lot of people are expecting. And when they had originally said that they were going to send these spacecraft to other stars, that was mostly to capture everyone's imagination. But the more practical use of this technology 
in the beginning is to use it to explore here in the solar system. And so when I asked Avi Loeb that, that question, his opinion was right in line with that, that um, the first most interesting targets for these spacecraft is here in the solar system. That's where you're going to, you're going to test out the capability of the lasers to accelerate the spacecraft. You're going to be testing their ability to send communication back to, to Earth. And I know that for a lot of planetary astronomers, if they could imagine sending hundreds or thousands of these little spacecraft, you know, zip, 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 just, you know, today send another thousand past every known object that we know in the solar system and do some quick telescope observations and spectroscopic analysis, or even send them a little slower and just send them into uh, orbits that will, you know, almost some, in some cases not necessarily capture orbits, but fly by orbits, things like that. That's where you're going to see this whole technology get developed is here in the solar system. Then you'll see it get used for those real interstellar distances once they've done the prototyping. So I think that's what we're going to see. And, and one of the things to also take note of is NASA is now putting together a... Uh, a CubeSat division, and they're going to start be doing start doing CubeSat competitive mission calls. We have the first prototypes going with Mars A and B, the two suitcase sats that are traveling alongside InSight, and that's just the start of a brand new. Well, we've had discovery missions, we've had uh, the great observatories. Well, now we're going to have CubeSat missions as well. I mean, it's this idea of, of having infrastructure in the solar system that will change everything. Because now you can send CubeSats to Mars, they pass along their communications to the bigger Mars spacecraft that transmit it back. Now you don't have to have a spacecraft with a transmitter and receiver. It can just do one little scientific job and then piggyback another infrastructure satellite to be able to send that communications back. As we get more and more spacecraft around other worlds, you can then send these smaller single purpose spacecraft to do this. So that's again going to be what more of the future will probably probably be. But that is the limiting factor is having those relay satellites. Yeah. Uh, missions like Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter have been there a mazillion years we have to have the missions like that that can relay back the signals also out at Jupiter, also yeah. out at Saturn, also out at like all New the places Horizons. they aren't. New Horizons is all transmitter. Pretty much, right? yes. <laughs> right? And, and, and it can only transmit back at just a couple of kilobits per second. So it took the better part of 18 months to transmit one day's photographs of Pluto back to Earth. It's going to take even longer now that it's going to be out at Ultima Thule, like much farther from where it was before. To imagine you had a really huge transmitter at Pluto and then you could just send new spacecraft, tiny little spacecraft, rovers, landers, and then they could, tra they could send up their data to the big transmitter and then it could send the data back to Earth. That's, the, that's a lot of the case, the problem with a lot of these spacecraft is they're mostly transmitter. Yeah. Morgan. It's always terrifying when the PhD in the room asks the yeah, questions. Yeah, no kidding. I'm ready for your question, Morgan. So I noticed you didn't say that we would land on Mars in the next 500 years. <laughs> uh, but let me rephrase that into a more interesting question. Uh, aside from Mars and the moon, what do you think the first place in the solar system is that humans will try to live on? So, I kind of think that asteroids, the idea that you see in The Expanse, the idea that you see in so many of Kim Stanley Robinson's books, so many science fiction writers, and this really is where we look to see our future in so many different ways, have speculated, you start on the surface, dig your way in, and we become the mole people of, <laughs> insert object. Um, I, in my, my happy little wants to write sci-fi future, uh, imagine Kim Stanley Robinson's idea of the hollow asteroids in the Hemholtz orbits that allow us to go live inside. And in, in one of his books, there's this idea that each one was its own ecosystem protecting the different kinds of animals that we have here on Earth currently. So I want to take the West African asteroid train uh, to transfer out to Jupiter and be inside that rotating asteroid visiting with the critters. 
I mean, I think, you know, you having co-hosted the Weekly Space Hangout with me enough times know my stock answer on this, that is that there is a fundamental question about human beings living on other worlds yeah. that is yet to be answered, which is, can a human being live on the low gravity of a place like the moon or Mars for any long period of time? And right now the answer is still unknown. Uh, we know that that microgravity, that zero gravity is bad for the human body and no amount of riding a bicycle in space is going to prevent the long-term uh, damage that happens to the you know, to the, the fluid redistribution and the various things that just can't be tackled by, by exercise. Can a human baby gestate on the surface of the moon or on the surface of Mars? Is it even safe to consider those kinds of things? We still don't have the answer to that question. And until we do, if the answer is yes, then we will probably see long-term human civilization on the moon and Mars. And if the answer is no, then we spin up an asteroid. Then, yeah, then, then they will never be anything beyond research stations, that you will go down to the surface of the moon, you'll go down to the surface of Mars, you'll spend however it is the length of time that has been scientifically figured out to be safe, and then you'll go back into space and let someone else take that damage to their, to their body. You can imagine uh, them attempting to compensate building big centrifuges on the surface of Mars and the moon that people will have to spend time in but then you might as well just live in space. So I 100% yeah. I agree with Pamela on this, that I think the vast majority of human beings in the far future will just live in space itself. There's room for trillions of people in the solar system, plenty of energy. You can make conditions exactly how you want it and, and live like that. And I think, it, of course, don't forget that Earth is awesome. And that it's weird to me that people are saying they wanna, they're going to want to live on places like the moon or Mars or even in space itself. And then they're going to try and figure out ways to make them as Earth-like as possible. Well, you know what's as Earth-like as possible is Earth. Well, the problem is we keep trying to make Earth Mars-like well, or sure. something. Yeah, we're Venus-forming <laughs> Earth. But let's say we stop doing that, that we do put our heavy industry off of Earth and out into space. And we let Earth just become the best place in the universe for life. As we know it. As we know it. Why, why wouldn't we want to live on Earth? Earth is, is all right. But I understand the, there's this idea of this adventure of like, wouldn't it be cool if I was like living in Antarctica? And people right? do that for small periods sure. of Briefly. time. And then after a while, they're like, this sucks. And they go, go, they go to Tahiti. <laughs> right. So I think that's, I think that, that, con that idea of like, oh, I want to be living on the forefront. I want to be a pioneer. I want to go live on, you know, eke out a rugged existence on the hellscape of Mars. And then a year into it, like, I can't breathe. I'm covered in radiation sickness. My bones are melting. And I just want to go and lie on a beach. And, and the you know, sand a, on the moon and Mars yeah. is basically glass and is going to shred yeah, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm coughing up my lungs. There's cancer everywhere. If yeah, you've I ever go had sand in your swimsuit, imagine it's moon dust that is basically glass bits. Yeah. And I'm not talking safety Mars isn't glass. Mars is so bad. Mars is ground down thanks to the uh, wind. To the the wind but the mars stuff is is no joke yeah so so that is going to be these constant threats these people are going to be facing so i i i think that we will try it and i know there's a lot of people that are going to go and try and live on mars and the moon and stuff but i think that they're going to find that earth is the best and we'll come back to earth no we'll always be able to live in space but but earth is the best until we have these gigantic you know, rotating O'Neill cylinders with tons of habitable space inside them and they're pressurized and protected from radiation and yeah. So of all the sciences, what is your favorite discovery of the past 20 years? All science is open. All science is open 20 years. So in our adulthood. I, man, it's weird to like, I don't, I would say CRISPR is fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. uh, just this, uh, this ability that we're going to have to mess with the human genome at a fundamental level, as if we were programming computer code. Um, and I think as a computer scientist person, the rise of AI through, through brute force uh, neural networks is this fascinating and terrifying development. And I'm, I'm amazed every time there's a new advancement like 
oh, it, Google figuring out how to beat the world's champion at Go, and then a year later, OpenAI figuring out how to beat the world's champions at Dota, right? <laughs> and you just imagine what the future is. And I was actually just having this argument with my son, because his, his, his imagination is incapable of predicting where this AI is going to go in just the next couple of, of years. They that, did argue this over breakfast Yeah, this we argued morning. this over breakfast. And I'm like, you know, in about five years, you're going to watch a Twitch stream where an AI is playing playing some game that you like better than any human in a team with a bunch of other AIs and they're all playing better than a team of humans but also that AI is going to be an avatar that's going to be chatting live with the people who are typing to it and it's going to be like producing memes in real time Isn't into the chat. is that a black mirror script? Yeah, maybe, right? And so, and they're going to be wildly entertaining and they're going to be funnier than any of us and like, so our days as podcasters are numbered uh, thanks to the rise of AI. So I find that really fascinating and terrifying but that is the part that i think in the last the rise of ai that yeah. that that has finally been cracked you know as you as i say hey google what time is it all right well i hope everyone's google's at home went off <laughs> <laughs> so so i have to say those were all extraordinarily serious for me my favorite now i'm not saying most awe-inspiring most like intellectually challenging but my favorite discovery is the realization that the reason so many different things taste like chicken is all those things are descended from dinosaurs so what it is is everything tastes like dinosaur <laughs> that is awesome Mmm, dinosaur. Any more questions? Chloe. Yes. Oh. Alberio was just declassified from a binary to an optical double. My first question is, there was a lot of data on that, I thought, and you could read that it seemed like pretty factual. How did we get it so wrong? And are we expecting Gaia to upset a lot of our fundamental knowledge on what we know, or are we just going to advance in what we currently thought was correct? Or how is that... How do you see that moving forward? So, so I have to admit, last time I looked up Albirio, I was a baby astronomer, and it was a double star and not a known binary. So I intellectually missed the part where they reclassified it as a binary. I know, I know. So we're going to go to Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're talking about is this post that Phil Plate made about two weeks ago where he said... I wondered if Alberio is an actual double star or whether it's just a visual binary. And so I went into the Gaia data, got some help with a bunch of Gaia uh, astronomers to help me crunch the data. And together we came to the conclusion that in fact the two stars in, Alber in Alberio are moving in different directions and they're not connected gravitationally. And, and, and this is, of course, a result of this, the wonderful Gaia mission, which has charted more than, a, what is it, a billion stars in the Milky Way is on, a, a, you know, yeah. on its way to finding where 1% of the stars are surrounding us with a level of accuracy that we've never had at our disposal. And this is the kind of low-hanging fruit yeah. that a showboater like Phil Plate went after, um, which is awesome. I loved it. And I loved the, the fact that he was like, I wonder, and then was able to get to the answer to this question. Yeah, but, I don't think it was known to be a binary star. I think there were limits on it. It was still an argument. Yeah. And so Gaia has been able to just put the wrap up this argument. But you looked you look in the in the astro page, you look in the scientific papers that are coming out from Gaia, and it's just it just keeps giving and yeah. giving and giving. People are mapping out white dwarfs around us and various O-type stars around us and other objects, asteroids, extrasolar planets, uh, proofs of dark matter, uh, all of this stuff is all coming out of this, yeah. this Gaia instrument, and it's just going to keep going. We're only halfway through the main observations made by, by Gaia, so just stay tuned. It's just going to get better and better. And, and I think Gaia papers are going to fall into three categories. The really boring statistical, I'm really glad somebody else did this, this is necessary research that answers fundamental where the heck are things in space questions. Then there's going to be the, wow, that's clever. Why didn't I think of that work that is coming up with the right question, realizing you write some software, and suddenly 
you solve Alberio, and not just Alberio, but all of the stars that are listed as possible visual binaries in the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's yearly almanac yeah, that no one knows if they're visual John. binaries or double stars. That's the super clever low-hanging database fruit. And then there's going to be the, because this is a amazing, large, rich database, we're suddenly going to discover, thanks to the statistics, things that we didn't even know were possible. Um, and then, of course, they're falling into the category of uh, it always happens, so it's over here as just background. There's going to be more shredded dwarf galaxies because we can't go a year without a press release on the Milky Way eating a dwarf galaxy. What is the latest on the imaging of the of Sagittarius A star? Energy? Oh, you're talking about the Event Horizon Telescope? Uh, oh. Spring 2019. So we are still about six months away from seeing those actual images. But anyone who, like, if you go to the Event Horizon Telescope website, they have been running constant observations of Sagittarius A for, like, almost a decade now and improving the blob that they're seeing. So if you go and look at the most recent picture of the blob and look at the predictions that are made by the people who've really studied the blobs that have come so far and they know what the next blob is going to look like, it's going to look, unless something really weird happens, it's going to look almost precisely like the predictions that have been made uh, based on past blobs. It's like if people are hoping to see this just churning maw of a black hole no. with material going into it and, you know, spacecraft stationed right outside and mad robots. No, you're just going to see like a blob and the blob, the size of the blobs that are around the bigger blob have got to be within certain amounts. And that tells you that that Einstein was right once again. My, my mental image is kind of like dust devil. Yeah. Very flat dust devil. You're going to see circle with blob on one side and blob on the other side. And if those blobs aren't where they are thinking they're going to be, then Einstein was wrong. And if those blobs are within certain parameters, then Einstein was right. I think that is the level that we're going to see. And I, man, pe people are so hyped about what this picture is going to look like and it is just going to be so underwhelming. I feel so bad for the people who are, because right now, you know, every time you write, in, you know, in a year from now, a telescope is going to take a picture of a black hole and it's going to be the best picture we've ever seen. And then all the people at the Event Horizon Telescope are like, look at all this press we're getting. Man, we're, we're this is going to be great. But and then, what if it is the next, like, pillars of creation? It's not. I know. There's no way. But it's that's be, what everyone is I know, thinking. And that's what I'm saying. And so the people right now, they are like the no man's sky of expectation in video games, right? <laughs> that here's our, okay, everybody ready? Here's the picture you were all waiting for. And you're just going to be like, <coughs> right? Yeah. So I think it's going to be, I think the internet is going to turn on, on them. And I think they should get ready and be trying to manage the expectations, the expectations the sooner than later because I think it's going to be when that picture is finally released I think people are going to be like what? The, this is why you should always take the Shoemaker Levy 9 route so my first time as a college student using one of the big national observatories was I was a summer student out at Kitt Peak National Observatory the summer of Shoemaker Levy 9. And, and we were all briefed, okay, expect to see nothing. This is going to happen on the side of Jupiter away from the Earth's ability to see anything and we expect nothing. Now there's a small probability that and then they detailed the stuff that we actually saw. And so there was a great deal of preparing you for lowered expectations, making you expect lowered expectations, but also explaining the science and preparing you for the oh wow possibility. This was the perfect way to do yep. it. We quite often go the opposite direction. When L Rock hit the moon, that was a perfect example. There were amateur astronomers everywhere ready to see the raised cloud from No, we saw nothing. 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 So be Shoemaker Levy Nine's press crew. This is the moral of yep. the story. Yeah. Hey. Um 
One of my favorite objects in the entire solar system is the planet, not the planet, the object Sedna and its extreme distance from everything else. And I was wondering, do you think that we'll, we'll be seeing an explosion of, of real estate discovered in the outer solar system of these tiny objects moving very slowly? What, what got me was seeing a paper a while back that said that Sedna might be an object that was captured based on the fact that it's a very different color than what we've seen. Now, it doesn't mean that that's true. That's just one of the papers trying to understand its crazy orbit. Its crazy orbit could be many, many different things. Its color might not be crazy. It Maybe it's just the first thing that's that set of colors in that set of orbits that we found. What intrigues me is a different version of that question, which is, are we going to discover more and more things that either we have captured or that are like umuamua, are simply passing through? So I want to know how many things have we stolen from other solar systems? And I think in the coming years, we're going to have an explosion in finding things that we have stolen and an explosion of things that we had never seen before. Yeah. Um, Mike Brown was the discoverer of, uh, of Eris and a lot of the other objects out in the, in the Kuiper Belt. He, he said that, that his discoveries were made, one, by them using the best tools at the time to search the places very comprehensively, but that all of the objects that they had found were at the very limits of what was possible to yeah. see. And it's going to be that next round of telescopes like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope and then those big super telescopes that are coming that are going to do that next round. And so moments after the LSST comes online, does its first observations of the night sky, you're going to find many, many new objects and then they're going to trickle away to nothing again and then you're going to have to wait for another big, powerful, even more powerful observatory to bring that next round. So those discoveries of those objects are matched with the new telescopes. Yeah. Let's do like one more question and then I think we've reached uh, the end of our of our time. Do we have? Okay, there we go. And I got one question. Oh, this is a good one actually on, on the internet too. So we have two questions. Look, let me take the question from the internet while you move the mic over. So Hal McKinney is asking, do neutrinos bump into each other with 60 plus billion per second per square centimeter passing through our bodies? What would you call a wave of neutrinos bumping into each other? Do neutrinos bump into each other? Well, I mean, statistically, you're occasionally going to, in the fullness of time, in the fullness of the universe, have a neutrino hit a neutrino. I, I, I'm trying to imagine the monkeys typing Shakespeare probability of a wave of neutrinos directly colliding with a wave of neutrinos, and you're going to Wolfram Alpha, aren't you? Uh, well, no. So, so one of the things that they're looking for is, is I mean, obviously, like the Ice Cube instrument, which yeah, is yeah, this great we'll big detector down in, um, down in in Antarctica. It's designed to capture when a neutrino collides with an atom, and when it does that it releases this cascade of particles that move through the entire detector like a, like a wave, and they are um, essentially generating radiation as they go, as they're bumping into other particles. So is, is Hal asking about one wave of neutrinos so coming just, towards us, or two well, waves like of neutrinos hitting each other? Two neutrinos colliding into each other, and then what would you get? And I don't know. Well, if they collide hard enough and actually interact, you'll get energy. And then it depends on their velocities, yeah. how much energy gets turned into other stuff yeah. and things. So the, the... The matter is, do they actually, like, so we don't have willfully the, interact? Yeah, they don't have the capability to detect. The, 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 the collisions would be so rare, and they don't have the capability to detect those collisions. So you would just imagine, with the vast number of neutrinos that are going on all the time, that they're going to collide, but we don't have the ability to actually detect those interactions yet. Do we know why globular clusters are spherical compared to galaxies and solar systems being more flat? There, there's uh, some really cool research coming out 
looking at the uh, formation of compressed pockets of gas around colliding galaxies, and they're starting to believe the formation of globular clusters is one of those huge mysteries that people keep trying to figure out. They're extraordinarily old objects. We know that many of the ones that we have in our galaxy were actually stolen from other galaxies that we eight. Uh, and so trying to figure it out, we don't generally look around and go, oh, there's, there's globular clusters forming over there. They're ancient objects. What we're starting to think is that some of the ultra compact um, areas, volumes of gas that have been shocked together in galaxy collisions might be the formation places of globular clusters. If this is the case, it's a matter that the formation of these star clusters is fundamentally different, leading to this extraordinarily dense environment with randomly distributed orbits that interact in a way that long-term models of globular clusters actually show them somewhat beating like a heart as they end up being super super dense in the center, having a lot of three-body interactions that fling new things outward, things come in, you get new binaries and triple systems forming. We, we think it's this fundamental difference in formation mechanism. People keep trying to make globular clusters this next step in how we understand the spheroids of galaxies. Uh, so one thought for a while in the late 90s, early 2000s was that if the mass of a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy is directly related to the size of the spheroid, the bulge if you have a disk galaxy, then if the velocities and the masses of these bulges are, are related and you should be able to keep going through the fundamental plane of galaxies and get to globular clusters. But then we're not finding the supermassive black holes and, and it looks like it's gonna have to be a how they formed is different kind of answer. All right, let's wrap things up. Uh, Again, thank you everybody for watching, everybody watching online. Pamela, thanks for uh, hanging out to do this gigantic 500th episode of Astronomy Cast. A big round of applause for yourselves and us and everybody watching. Uh, I'm gonna be on a boat next week, so I don't think we'll be doing an episode next week, but then we'll return now once I get back to uh, Canada. And, don't forget, if you want to see us in person, this is always a possibility. I am going to be attending the Skeptics Association of Australia's big meeting in Sydney in a couple of weeks, and I'll be in Melbourne as well. All of those dates are going to be getting posted online, probably tomorrow when I wake up after a long sleep to recover from this. <laughs> uh, yeah. And both of us are working with Paul Matt Sutter, and I will be taking a group of people to the dry, hot deserts of the American so South Southwest to explore the canyon lands and the observatories a year from now. So enjoy your gorgeous cruise. I look forward to my days in the desert. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. I'm going to stop the stream. Yeah. All right. <laughs>